folks, we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm saying this very loudly, so hopefully the people in the back can hear as well. All right. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us for the second contributed talk session. Uh, we have some exciting talks for you. So, just there they are. And so, each of these talks is going to be about 20 minutes in length, including the question period. And I will let the first speaker come up now. So Akshay, I think you're up. And come up and take it away. Hello. Cool. Cool. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Akshay, uh, and I'm very excited today to be uh, sharing some really new work uh, examining the effect of attention on object representations in the human visual system. Uh, before we begin, I just want to thank the organizers for, uh, in, uh, for putting this together and for uh, bringing, bringing this whole community together here. Um, okay. So to really understand how objects are represented by our visual system, uh, it's useful to consider a different type of stimulus, uh, which is visual textures. So textures are stimuli containing complex visual features that are typically spatially homogeneous. So texture often refers to the surface properties of objects uh, in contrast to the shape or the configuration of an object. Um, and your visual system is extremely good at distinguishing between textures that have different visual features, uh, like these images here. Um, but what's so interesting about textures uh, is that your visual system is not very good at distinguishing between different texture samples that have similar visual features in different spatial configurations, like these three different images of grass on the right here, even though all of those images have completely different uh, pixels. Um, and that's quite different, however, from how we perceive objects, uh, for which we are really sensitive to the spatial configuration of visual features that makes up an object, which is why this image of a leopard looks extremely different from these scrambled images which contain the same visual features. So the overarching question in this talk is going to be, how does the brain support object perception? Uh, specifically, how are objects, both their features and their configurations, represented in the human visual system? Uh, and secondly, what is the role of attention, if any, uh, in visual object perception? So first, how does the human visual system represent objects? And the results in this first half of the talk were published earlier this year. So uh, please check out our paper for details that I may skip over in the interest of time today. OK, so when it comes to the question of how the human visual system represents objects, it is necessary to distinguish representations of complex visual features uh, from the configurations of those features which are key for object perception. So decades of research has shown us that the ventral visual cortex uh, in humans and primates contains functionally specialized regions that prefer specific stimuli such as faces or scenes or words. And all of this has led to the widespread view that the ventral stream explicitly represents objects. However, we haven't yet ruled out the possibility that the ventral visual cortex doesn't represent objects as a whole but rather just complex visual features, the complex shapes, curvatures, textures, and colors that make up objects. So these two hypotheses are, of course, really difficult to disentangle. Um, and prior work has attempted to do so by scrambling up images and comparing the neural response between intact and scrambled images. However, these scrambling manipulations uh, end up disrupting not only the configuration of features in objects, but also the complex visual features themselves. 
So this alternate hypothesis remains a possibility, which is that the ventral visual cortex may not represent objects per se, but rather the complex visual features that make up objects, regardless of their spatial configurations, that is, textures. So to fully distinguish these two hypotheses, we need a set of stimuli that will allow us to vary the complexity of visual features, as well as their spatial configuration, somewhat independently. And so we decided to synthesize these stimuli by adapting a computational image synthesis te technique introduced by Gaddis and colleagues. So to synthesize stimuli, we pass an image into a pre-trained deep convolutional neural network, VGG19, extract the activations from a set of intermediate layers, and compute the correlation between each pair of feature maps within a given layer. This gives us a set of texture statistics, which describe the spatially pooled features of the image. So now we can take a white noise image and use gradient descent to iteratively update the pixels until it contains the same texture statistics as the original image. And by matching early layer features, we can synthesize images with simple features. And by including later layer features in the synthesis process, we generate images that have more complex visual features in them. Now, we can also divide these images into uniform-sized subregions or spatial pooling regions and synthesize images uh, which have matching texture statistics constrained within these subregions. And this allows us to control the extent over which it features can be spatially scrambled. So here I'm showing you an example of a few different stimuli. First, original images and their corresponding synthesized images varying first in their feature complexity uh, and then in the level of spatial constraint. So now we can use this set of stimuli to ask three main questions. First, are humans perceptually sensitive to feature complexity and spatial arrangement of features for objects? Second, what about deep convolutional neural networks? And thirdly, what about the human visual cortex? So we're gonna do this using an oddity task in which subjects were presented with three images. Uh, oops. When subjects were presented with three images, one original image containing an object and two synthesized images matched to the features of the original. And subjects in this task are just asked to choose the odd one out, the image which looks most different from the other two. So I'm gonna plot the behavioral performance here now in terms of the proportion of trials where subjects correctly chose the real object image as the odd one out. So as we increase the complexity of visual features in the synthesized images, subjects were more likely to confuse the original image with the synthesized images. And similarly, when we increase the constraint on spatial arrangement of visual features, subjects were more likely to confuse the original image with the synthesized images. So we can use this to conclude that humans are perceptually sensitive to both the feature complexity and the spatial configuration of object features. What about DCNN models? So to assess this, we built an observer model that makes use of features from a pre-trained DCNN model to estimate choice probabilities on each trial of this oddity task. So I'm skipping over the details here, but in essence, this model will choose the image whose feature representation is most different from the other two images presented on each trial. Okay, so how did DCNN models perform on this task? Um, so like humans, DCNN models were also very sensitive to feature complexity. But unlike humans, their performance dropped to chance level at picking out the real object image when the synthesized images contained complex visual features. And this was true regardless of how... Oops. Sorry. And this was true regardless of how scrambled those complex visual features in the synthesized images were. So that is, DCNNs were insensitive to the spatial configuration of features when controlling for feature complexity. So to understand why these models seem to be behaving so differently from human observers, we examined their internal representational geometry. Um, so we can look at the representational distances between pairs of real and scrambled object images um, within the last convolutional layer of a DCNN model. Um, and then visualize these pairwise distances in two dimensions, which is what you're looking at here on the left. And what this tells us is that the internal representations in the, in the DCNN models don't treat the natural image, the real object, very differently from these synthesized scrambled images. So we can also do a similar thing for human perception, uh, but to calculate human representational distances, 
uh, we had to collect an independent data set of people comparing the relative similarity between pairs of images, uh, and then we used maximum likelihood estimation to estimate the representational distances that would be most likely to generate those responses. Um, and when we do this, we get a very different picture of the perceptual geometry. Um, so this tells us that the perceptual distance between a real object and a scrambled image is far greater than the distance between two different scrambled images. So perceptually, people are quite selective for the natural feature configuration of objects, while these DCNN models clearly lack this configural selectivity as long as the images contain similar complex visual features. So this result actually fits pretty well into a growing body of work suggesting that ImageNet trained deep convolutional neural networks are texture biased, meaning if you probe the classification performance of ImageNet trained DCNN models on images which are artificially made to have conflicting texture and shape information, the DCNN models will generally label this image according to its texture, whereas humans will overwhelmingly choose the shape label here. Okay, so humans are sensitive to both feature complexity and spatial configuration. Uh, whereas DCNNs are insensitive to the spatial configuration of complex visual features. So what about human visual cortex? So using MRI, we measured bold responses while subjects viewed real and synthesized images drawn from 10 different image classes. So subjects were passively viewing the images while performing a color discrimination task at the fixation cross. Um, that's gonna be really important later on, so hold on to that. Um, and we perform retinotopic mapping to define early visual cortical areas, as well as a functional category localizer to define high-level category selective regions. And similar to the DCNN models, we constructed an observer model that makes use of cortical bold responses to perform this three-way oddity task. So basically, this model will choose the image on each trial whose neural response is most different from the other two images presented on that trial. Okay, so as a data quality check, we ran a traditional categorization version of this task where people were shown three natural images, one of which contained an object of a different category and two of which contained objects of the same category and subjects were asked to choose the odd one out. So on this task, we found that bold responses plotted here on the x-axis were able to match human performance plotted on the y-axis quite well in most high-level visual cortical areas. So the bold responses that we're measuring contain useful information for discriminating between different categories of objects that have different visual features. Uh, similarly, the DCNN models match human performance quite well. All of this is quite unsurprising given what we know about the category selectivity of human visual, ve uh, ventral visual cortex and deep convolutional neural network models. Okay, so what did we find for our task where subjects compared real objects to synthesized scrambled images? Okay. So to our great surprise, we found that the representations in visual cortex were far worse than human behavior at picking out the real object image from amongst scrambled synthesized images. And in fact, in most visual areas, the, the visual cortical response was no better than chance at identifying the original image amongst scrambled synthesized images containing complex visual features. So we can do the same type of representational geometry plotting we did earlier. Uh, and what this reveals is that whereas perceptually, humans very clearly differentiate real objects from scrambled objects, the visual cortical representation is non-selective for real object configuration. That is, real objects aren't any, aren't any more different in the ventral visual cortical representation from scrambled images than two different scrambled images are to each other. So as an interim summary here, we're showing that perceptually, humans are sensitive to the feature configuration of objects. Uh, but visual cortical representations are not configurally selective, though they do contain feature representations capable of discriminating different categories of objects. So from this, we can conclude that human ventral visual cortex and DCNNs don't in fact explicitly encode objects, but rather contain a texture-like feature representation. So of course, the big question is, how do you then reconcile these neural results with these behavioral results? Um, how does this texture-like representation support object perception? So we suggest that perhaps some downstream processes read out and transform these texture-like features in service of some goal-driven behavior. So remember that the human subjects in the scanner weren't actually performing any tasks on the stimuli, and perhaps the engagement in tasks might uh, initiate some, uh, some downstream processes that would generate more object-like representations. 
And it turns out this view is really not all that new at all. So since the 1980s, folks like Ann Treisman and Bella Ulez have theorized that when passively viewing stimuli, the visual system extracts a set of feature maps, but it requires focal attention to integrate those feature maps into unitary objects. So using our stimuli, we set out to examine the role of attention in object perception. And we did so using a covert attention, same different task. So subjects were trained to fixate centrally and then presented with a cue, either a focal cue, which tells them which of four locations to pay attention to, or a distributed cue, which tells them that they have to split their attention across all four locations. We then very briefly flash four images on the screen, take them away, and then flash four images again. And at this time, each location might either contain the exact same image or a scrambled version of that image, or that location might contain a completely different image altogether. Subjects were then queued to one location and asked to indicate whether the two images presented at that location were the same or different. So I want to highlight one big thing here, which is that subjects are keeping their eyes fixated centrally the whole time. So this means that any differences in performance are not attributable to differences in the visual input since in all conditions, the retinal inputs are gonna be exactly the same, and any differences in performance must be due to some internal covert attention process happening inside their brains. Okay, so just to give you a little bit of an intuition for what this task would feel like, let's do a little demo of this. Um, so we'll start with a distributed cue trial. So while keeping your eyes fixated at the central cross, try to attend to all four locations, uh, and then after I'll ask you whether these two images shown at one of these locations were the same or different. Okay, so clap if you thought the images were the same at that top left location and stomp your feet if you thought they were different. Okay, so the, the clappers are correct. It was, they were the same, but hopefully you felt like this was somewhat difficult. Um, so let's try that one more time, uh, but this time I'm gonna give you a focal cue. So you're still keeping your eyes fixated at that central dot, uh, but now you can orient your covert attention to that bottom right spatial location ahead of time. Cool, so clap if they were the same, stomp if they were different. Cool, I heard a lot more stomps. Uh, indeed, these images were the same. So as you can probably tell, it's quite a bit easier to discriminate these images when you're able to spatially attend to them, even though, again, in both of these situations, retinal input was exactly the same. Okay, so first I'll show you the behavioral data um, to see the perceptual effect of attention, and secondly, we'll examine the neuroimaging data to see the effect of attention on cortical object representations. Okay, so how did attention affect behavioral performance in this same different discrimination task? So here I'm showing human behavioral performance. On the left, for trials where subjects discriminated objects from two different categories, and on the right, for trials where subjects discriminated real object images from scrambled images with matching features. And as you can see, when given a focal attentional cue, subjects are nearly perfect in both of these conditions. But when cued to uh, split their attention, subjects' performance drops significantly for a categorical discrimination, um, but we observe an even bigger drop in performance when splitting attention for configural discrimination. So from this, we conclude that yes, focal spatial attention does improve object perception, more so for configural discrimination than for featural discrimination. All right, next we'll look at the effect of attention on visual cortex responses. And when running this experiment in the scanner, we simplified it to just have two spatial locations, left and right, uh, instead of four. So all the results you'll see will be showing the effect of attention when cued contralaterally, meaning the opposite hemifield, uh, versus ipsilaterally, ipsilaterally, meaning the same hemifield. Um, and all of our analyses here are computed within each individual subject. And then for visualization, I'm just showing you group averages across all subjects. Okay. Um, So attention, uh, so, 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 oh, I'm sorry. So, uh, so now we, we first examine the effect of attention on the mean bold responses that were evoked in visual cortical regions. Um, and here we're replicating probably the most widely observed consequence of attention on cortical responses, which is that attention amplifies bold responses. Uh, so I've plotted here the mean bold response across all voxels in each of these areas as a function of whether the subject was cued to attend contralaterally or ipsilaterally. Uh, and, and what we're seeing is that across basically all visual areas from V1 to the ventral temporal regions, when you're attending contralaterally, the magnitude of bold responses increases. 
Okay, so next we wanted to examine whether attention makes cortical responses more reliable and more informative. So we compute a measure of SNR for each voxel, which is basically uh, quantifies the variance in response across different images divided by the variance in response across repeats of the same image. Um, and here what we find is that there was no improvement in SNR in early visual cortical areas, V1 through V3, because of attention. But in higher level visual cortex, there is a, there is a very modest improvement in SNR when cued contralaterally. So finally, we wanted to see whether this improvement in discriminability is specific to the distinction between real objects and scrambled objects, which would align with the behavioral measures that we've been looking at. Um, so we computed this object selectivity index which quantifies the degree to which the population response in a given region differentiates the natural object image compared to multiple scrambled images. Um, and so what we're finding here is that indeed attention does improve selectivity for object configuration in many different visual areas. Uh, so just to make this index more intuitive, we can also visualize the representational geometry between real and scrambled images in those triangular distance plots we used earlier. And here, again, we see that when cued ipsilaterally, the representation is non-selective for natural object configurations. And when cued for uh, contralaterally, the representation becomes slightly more discriminative, uh, more selective for the natural object configuration compared to scrambled configurations. Okay, so we've shown three main effects of attention on cortical responses to objects. Um, first, we showed that attention increased mean bold amplitudes. Second, we showed that attention increases the reliability and informativeness of voxel responses. And finally, we showed that attention makes population responses in visual cortex more configurally selective for natural objects. Okay, so the, the results I've shown you today are still quite fresh, but there are a few big takeaways. So one, without attention, human ventral visual cortex contains a texture-like representation of objects. Um, attention does improve object perception, but more so for configural discrimination than for featural discrimination. Um, and thirdly, attention makes visual cortex representations more object-like, that is more selective for natural feature configurations. So there's still a ton of really important questions for us to answer, uh, including understanding the computations by which attention actually transforms these visual object representations and formalizing that into a model. Um, but our results provide some preliminary behavioral and physiological evidence that indeed attention does play an important role in generating cortical representations of objects to underlie object perception. Uh, so with that, I'll conclude. Uh, and if I have any time left, I'd be happy to take any questions. Um, I'm also very happy to continue these conversations at a later time. So if you're interested, please do check out our paper and feel free to get in contact with me. So thank you everyone for your attention. Great, thanks for the interesting talk, Akshay. And we can take a couple questions. Hey, uh, great talk. Uh, I'm John Mark Taylor from Columbia. So my question was, so you alluded to possible downstream mechanisms that might take, take these textures and then form the object representations. So to me, a very obvious candidate is the, the dorsal pathway, right? So it's involved in attention. You damage it, and you get these you know, illusory conjunction binding errors. So I was wondering if you had any like speculations as to how the, the dorsal stream might fit into this. Um, I don't have speculation. I can point you to recently published work um, I, uh, in, in Journal of Neuroscience, uh, I think the, the, the authors were Eisenberg and Behrman that show that there are uh, configural selectivity in the dorsal stream in the IPS areas. Uh, we also like find some evidence that some of the really big attention effects show up in the parietal regions and maybe lend some credence to the idea that the, the parietal attention uh, areas are involved. But um, I, I think there is something to the idea that dorsal stream uh, action-guided representations would be more configurally selective than a ventral stream representations. Cool, thanks. Yeah, thanks for the question. And I think that's all the time we have for questions, um, but unfortunately you can, you can ask him any questions after the session. Yeah, sure. We can have the second speaker come up now. Hello everyone, I'm really excited to be here. My name is Gal Vishne and I'm a graduate student in the lab of Professor Leon Dewell in the Hebrew University. 
This is my first CNN, which has been absolutely fantastic, so I want to thank everyone involved first. And also, before I start, I want to mention that everything that I'm going to discuss and more is in a preprint that we really recently uploaded, so you're encouraged to check that out. I'll also flash the link again in the end. Um, so now, um, my talk title is Multivariate Representation of Sustained Visual Content in a No-Report Paradigm. It's pretty heavy. I'll start by unpacking the sustained visual content part, and then we'll circle back to the multivariate representation and the no-report parts. So I'm going to start with a short demonstration. All you have to do is look at the screen, no tricks. So just please look at this image here. Try to concentrate on the nose. I'm assuming you're all aware of the statue of President Lincoln. Uh, so just keep looking for a few moments. OK, so you're still aware of the statue, right? But surprisingly, we can describe quite well what happened in your brain when the image first appeared on the screen, and much less is known about what is going on in your brain now as you continue to look. So although we're still aware of the image even after a few seconds, we really don't know how it's represented in your brain at this point. So this is the gap that we attempted to fill. Now, I want to emphasize that the time ranges I'm talking about are even shorter than what you just experienced. So I'm not talking about staring at the image for prolonged periods, really just the first second or two after the image appeared on the screen. Um, because this also, um, although this is very common, it's not the eyes are still on the same object, even if there's small movement. Um, but really, almost all of vision neuroscience so far, everything at least with time resolved methods, focused on the first 300 to 500 milliseconds after the onset. So this is already a big gap in our understanding in vision research. But assuming that we're still aware of the world in these really common periods of brief perceptual stability, it, then this also means that it has a lot of implications for theories of conscious awareness. So let's describe that briefly. So it, very briefly, the scientific quest for consciousness focuses in the last decades mainly on identifying the neural correlates of consciousness, defined as the minimal neuronal mechanisms that are necessary and sufficient for any specific con conscious percept. So since this was uh, formulated in the 1990s, uh, many theories have been proposed, but the field is really far from convergence. And now our study addresses directly two big controversies in the field. So first, many theories tie conscious, uh, um, uh, consciousness to an ignition of activity. But our previous 2017 paper uh, studying these extended or the, the visual responses after the onset showed that activity in category selective regions in the ventral visual stream, which are thought to represent our ongoing perceptual experience, actually goes down very dramatically after the onset response. So this means that we have a very surprising dissociation between ongoing uh, or between activity and between experience. And it also says that uh, actually this activity or activity only cannot really be the true NCC because we expect that to be there all the time, not just in, uh, when changes occur. So this led us to transition from looking at activation dynamics to looking at information dynamics uh, or representation dynamics more directly. The second controversy is about the anatomical location of the NCC. So many studies, including the one that I'm showing here, uh, showed the correlation between prefrontal activations and awareness. Um, now, this led some uh, theories to suggest that it's not just correlations, but really an essential part of consciousness. Um, but more recently, other authors have argued that this is actually not really a correlate of awareness, but uh, just a byproduct of the report in the task, just the fact that subjects have to say whether they see something or not every trial. So to address this, we use just passive trials. I should um, maybe clarify that our task is not all no report, like there is a task, but almost all of the trials don't have any response, and we only focus on these trials in their analysis. I'll elaborate on that more in a bit. So in our lab, we've been interested for some time now in sustained no-report viewing. More recently, this was adopted by a very large international collaboration, maybe some of you have heard about it, the Cogitate Consortium, which is attempting to arbitrate between uh, two main theories of consciousness, a uh, global neuronal workspace theory and integrated information theory. Now, super briefly, and you're welcome to ask me more about it later, um, GNW ties uh, consciousness to activity in a distributed network, termed the global workspace, and this network necessarily includes PFC, and it is, um, now, a bit counterintuitively, they actually hypothesized that we're not really aware of the stimulus for the entire duration, just at the onset when the, uh, when the workspace is being updated, so they predict a transient representation of information in PFC, but this should be there even when there's no report. 
IoT ties consciousness to a broad and vaguely defined uh, region called the posterior hot zone, um, but importantly, this also includes the uh, sensory regions. So uh, the ventral temporal stream is included in this. And on the temporal side, they are committed to a sustained and stable representation corresponding to the duration of this, uh, the stimulus. So now that we have the motivation, it's time for more concrete details. Um, so this study is a reanalysis of intracranial data collected previously in our lab and published in this 2017 paper by Gerber et al. Um, so our participants are actually 10 patients undergoing surgery for intractable epilepsy with more than 1,000 electrodes altogether in both hemispheres and all cortical lobes. So the task was mostly, as I said, without any responses. We did require uh, participants to respond in one of two cases, either when they saw an image of a clothing item or when the image became blurry near the end of the presentation, which could be any image, not just the one that, present, that I presented here. Uh, so this was just to make sure that they're maintaining attention. Um, but in most of the trials, they simply sat and viewed the images, and we only used these passive trials. Now, the images that we used belong to multiple categories, and importantly, multiple durations. The multiple categories were used to be able to ask about the content of experience, not just whether an image is shown or not. Um, so these are the categories that we use. I'm treating here separately watch faces and other objects because they came from different data sets. So the watch faces are actually photos like the human faces, and the other objects are illustrations. And often, uh, watch faces are considered a better control for low-level features when you're comparing to human faces. Um, and I should also say that afterwards we also examine representation of single exemplars. Um, the multiple durations are really important because this is what enables us to dissociate between a response to the change to the onset of the stimulus and something that really corresponds to the duration of experience. So the three highlighted durations are the ones that were shown to all patients and these are the ones that I'll focus on. So as this is an intracranial data set, we can ask both when and where sustained no report content is represented. So we analyze our data based on six cortical ROIs, which you can see here. And the, uh, the measurement of activity that we use is the amplitude in high frequencies, which already multiple studies have shown to be correlated with firing rate. So at this point, it wouldn't surprise you that we're focusing on two main questions. First, where is sustained a, a content represented, specifically thinking already of posterior sensory regions, and we ask if this is stable and did corresponds to the ongoing percept. And second, we asked, will the prefrontal cortex still represent content, uh, visual content even when no report is required? Um, now, thanks to the adversarial collaboration, we know actually that these map quite nicely to the predictions of IIT and GNW. So that's already one important contribution made by them. Um, now, in both of these cases, we looked at representation in two levels, at the level of visual category and at the level of single exemplars. So starting with the visual category, um, we, uh, uh, we tackled this question using time-resolved decoding uh, for each region separately. Um, we also looked at the state-space trajectories uh, for, uh, in response to each category, which led to similar results. So I'll focus on the decoding. Um, I'm re presenting here results for four out of the six ROIs because the other two were less visually responsive, though there was some information there as well. Um, so we use AUC to measure uh, classifier success, so that's what you see in the y-axis. The x-axis represents time and the horizontal lines are uh, significant clusters. And now importantly, all of the trials that are used here are presented for 900 milliseconds or longer. So any time here after zero, there's an image presented. So you'll see two important things already here. First, you see in the top row that uh, in posterior regions, we found very sustained decoding, especially in VT. Um, so it's throughout the presentation of the image. Now, the second thing is that in the prefrontal cortex and parietal cortex, we still find very high decoding. It's only at the onset, it's not sustained, but it's very high, even though there was no response in any of these trials. So now, focusing on the first point, we also asked that if this representation is not only sustained, but stable. So for this, we use the temporal generalization method, where we train classifiers on each time point separately, but we test them on all time points, not just the one that was used for the training. Um, and so if this is significant, it means that the pattern separating the categories between these two time points remains stable. So you see here the temporal generalization matrices for VT and for PFC for comparison. Um, now the points outlined in black are significant. Um, so you can see that the representation VT was remarkably stable. In PFC, we also get very high decoding at the beginning, but then it largely subsides. And here too, the images were presented for 900 milliseconds. 
Um, next to each of the uh, panels, you see the mean over groups of 200 milliseconds of training time, which shows this stability in VT even more clearly because it shows that it doesn't really matter when you train the classifier. Testing on pretty much all time point after 100 milliseconds will lead you to near perfect performance. So this really seems to suggest that um, it's not the activity in posterior regions, but there's still information in posterior regions that corresponds to the ongoing percept. But we have another test left, because if this information thing that really corresponds to perception, then we expect to see different information uh, dynamics for stimuli in different durations. So we repeated this analysis, this time using a stimuli of each duration separately. So in all of these panels, the brightest color corresponds to the coding of the 300 millisecond stimulus and the darkest color to the uh, longest uh, 1500 uh, millisecond stimulus. Um, now again, the horizontal lines correspond to significant clusters and now they're color coded according to the stimulus duration. So you can see that in posterior regions, we get uh, clusters that correspond to the uh, duration of the stimulus, whereas we still get high uh, significant decoding in PFC and parietal cortex, but it doesn't correspond to the stimulus duration now. And we also tested this directly by looking at the difference time courses. So now the dark line is a difference of 1500 and 900, bright line difference of 900 and 300, and you see that we got significant difference clusters only in VT and occipital cortex. So this really suggests that it is the um, representation in these regions does correspond to the ongoing percept. Um, but this is not all, because representation is more than a, a, sorry, perception is more than a category of an image. Look to the left, you see a statue of a person. Look to the right, you see a statue of a person. But these statues of President Washington and President Lincoln don't, uh, are not consciously perceived to be the same. So after we uh, looked at the neural correlates of sustained category information, we turned to examine sustained exemplar information. So we define the region as representing single exemplar information if the relation between responses to different exemplars remained reliable across repetitions. This sounds somewhat vague, but it's actually very analogous to our definition for category information, where we tested uh, if the relation between responses to different categories was reliable across exemplars. So now instead of looking at different exemplars in each category, we're looking at different repetitions of each exemplar. Uh, so for this analysis, we use only uh, images that were presented at least twice, and uh, because of this, uh, just for technical reasons, uh, we have to use data from only five of the patients. Um, so we actually used a few measures to test this. I'm going to focus on just one, which we term item reliability. Um, so what we do here is for each image separately, and this is denoted here by the red star, we, um, we compute the distance or dissimilarity in state space to all other images in the first repetition, that's the field shapes, and all other images in the second repetition, that's the empty shapes. And we correlate these to see how similar they are. So this is an average for all images. Um, and importantly, we repeat this procedure, but now we shuffle actually the stimulus identity each time in one of the repetitions. And we do this again and again and again to construct a whole distribution which is used to standardize to Z-score the original correlations. This is important because effectively it means that we're not just testing for preservation of the distance structure, we're also testing whether the distance structure to begin with uh, actually represents exemplars distinctly. Uh, because we're testing against the null hypothesis that exemplar identity didn't really matter for the structure. Um, so there's more details in the paper, and, but you can also ask me later. So these are our results for exemplar representation using this metric. Again, you can see that we found a, a significant representation in both posterior and in anterior regions, um, though here the difference between the two is more prominent. Now in posterior regions, we also get here quite sustained information, uh, more so in vitae though than occipital cortex. Now this could still be the result of category information conveyed by the dissimilarity structure. So to test this, we designed four models of category information. They're also based on the relations between the categories in the regions that I didn't show in more detail. Um, so in all of these models, we assume that the exemplars uh, within each category are fully similar to each other. That's the white regions. And between categories, the single category model, sorry, assumes that they're fully dissimilar. And then the other three models build on this, but add a hierarchy of relations between the different categories. So for example, the low level model assumes that our uh, round, uh, round photos, the human faces and the watch faces are actually more similar to each other than they are to the other categories. And it's similar also for the other models. 
So now for each region, we took the model that explained the most category information, so like putting the hardest control, and we repeated the reliability calculation, but now um, partialing out the information in this model. So because we had correlations in the previous slide, it was just replacing them with partial correlations now. Um, and so these are the gray lines, I hope you see them in here. So it's the gray lines now added in each panel. So it's consistent with our decoding results that the, um, it, the values do go down, but still we get significant uh, exemplar reliability in all regions, and it's still quite sustained in VT. So now we also wanted to test if this is stable, like we did for the decoding. Um, really briefly, we extended our measure to test for stability in time by correlating the similarity structures between time points. Um, so this is what you see here. Uh, I put here only the result without partialing the model, but it also uh, remained uh, similar after partialing it out. So we get very sustained, uh, very stable representation in VT, also for exemplar information. Now, really briefly, I don't know how much time I have, I'll just uh, mention exemplar information in single categories. Um, so this is a lot noisier than what I showed in the previous slides because of a dramatic reduction in the number of exemplars. But still, uh, we got very clear uh, exemplar information for multiple regions. So what I'm showing here is actually just a few examples. For VT and occipital cortex, we found single exemplar information within multiple single categories. Uh, so also uh, like objects, uh, animals, and faces for both of them. Um, for PFC though, it was restricted only to the face category. Um, and actually, if you compare it to what we got in PFC using the entire geometry, it's even more robust than that. So it really suggests that PFC represents distinct faces, but not so much the distinct exemplars in the other categories. So on the top here, you have the dynamics for each um, uh, of these uh, category region pairs, uh, similar to what you saw before. The vertical colored line is the point of the maximal reliability, um, which is what is plotted below them. Um, so then below, we took just the just for illustration, the point with the, the most exemplar information, um, and we use TSNI to visualize the neural responses to both repetitions of all images in the category in that region. Um, so just for so. Sorry, so it means that the location of each image in this space corresponds to the neural response to viewing that same image. Just for convenience now, we color coded the frames of these images according to the exemplar identity. Um, so just to help you see that it, the repetitions of the same exemplars are um, represented more similarly than repetitions of different exemplars. Um, so I think I'm probably running out of time. Um, so I just wanna conclude. Um, so let's go back to our two motivating questions. So first we asked, is sustained and stable content represented in a sustained and stable form in posterior sensory regions? We got excellent evidence for that, both for category information and exemplar information. So this suggests that it is in these regions that underlie our experience of perceptual stability, but it's not done by the activation level per se. Now, our, uh, our second question was about the prefrontal cortex and whether it would still represent uh, visual content even though there's no report in any of the trials. We found evidence for this also both at the category level and at the exemplar level. Um, so again, um, so to us this suggests that, um, that the prefrontal cortex will be involved in perceptual changes regardless of the task, so this is somewhat speculative because we only know that it's still involved when we have no report. Um, now, importantly, thanks to the Cogitate Consortium, we can map this really nicely to the predictions of two main theories of consciousness, to IIT and GNW, so we can actually set up a scoreboard. So IIT predicted that we'll find sustained and stable representation in a, a, the posterior hot zone, which we said also includes sensory regions, including VT, so we can mark that for both the category representation and exemplar representation, so it means that we have two points for IIT. GNW predicted that we will have representation of visual content in prefrontal cortex even when there's no report. And again, we found that both for category information and for exemplar information. So two points for GNW. So this means that we have a tie, and it's really important because it shows that this approach alone, at least, cannot really arbitrate between the theories. Um, it's just that the predictions are, not, uh, are actually independent. We can and we do have both a prefrontal ignition and a sustained posterior representation, and these are just not mutually exclusive. 
So it's an important take home message. And I just want to thank you all for your attention. And I want to thank the collaborators on this project. So Leon, which is really the best advisor one can ask for, um, Ed and Gerber and Bob Knight, which initiated this uh, project and were crucial to collecting the data, the patients, of course. Um, and the funding sources, and uh, I just encourage you to look at the preprint, and I'll also be happy to keep discussing things later, either through these channels or just come to me here in person. So thank you. Great. And I think we have time for maybe one really quick question. <laughs> I've got somebody on the right side there. Hi, uh, thanks for the great talk. Um, so one of your criteria for like a consciousness region was um, well, it's really sustained and stable, but you know, a big feature about consciousness is that it's dynamic. Um, you know, I might be looking at something and my thoughts are constantly changing. So wouldn't a better criteria be a region where you know, decoding actually goes up and then back down and then up and back down rather than just stable? Um, I think it's a really good point. I think it might be harder technically because we don't know when it should go back up and down. Um, our rationale here was, again, emphasizing that we keep saying sustained viewing, but these are really still very brief periods. There is still something when you're doing the experiment, it's not flashing as fast as what we get in, in usual visual perception experiments, but it's still pretty fast. There isn't too much time to really dissociate and think of something else. So this is why I really wanted to emphasize that it's not a, a staring or daydreaming where I totally agree. I do not expect at all to keep seeing the same activity for second, for long seconds now, but for one and a half seconds, it seems um, it's, it's still possible that we're wrong, but it seems more reasonable to assume that. Yeah, thanks. Cool. Awesome, all right, let's thank Gal one more time and we can have the third speaker come up now. So hi everyone, um, I'm Maria, and today I'm going to talk about um, my main results from my PhD project, and I'm very excited that you're all here to listen to it. So um, I would like to start my talk with a question to all of you, and I would like you to think about your subjective experience of being here right now, your experience of the present moment. And I would like you to ask yourself, how far back in time does your experience of being here right now actually stretch? So this is not a new question that people in the field of psychology are asking. For example, um, William James, he talks about the idea of the specious presence. And what he's saying is that the prototype of all conceived times is the specious present the short duration of which we are immediately and incessantly sensible. And what I really want to stretch here is that he thinks that, you know, depending on the um, situation, how far back in time actually counts for us as being the present varies depending on the situation. And this is what my ta talk today is actually about. So now let's turn back to decision making. And many of you probably know this paradigmatic task. So what happens is the monkey fixates and then a cloud of um, randomly moving dots comes on and the monkey needs to make a decision in which direction the dots are moving. And so when we think about this task, when we are actually telling the monkey to focus on, we are actually explicitly cueing it, it when the present begins because that is when the moving dots come on and ideally the monkey should um, equally weigh every evidence sample to make a decision. So, but this is not what we do in our world because that is continuous and there's a continuous stream of information, meaning that we should really adapt our evidence integration kernels to different timescales. So what I mean by that is if you, for example, consider yourself being on a bike on a road, 
you probably only want to focus on the last couple of seconds to be aware, for example, if there's a car coming out of the drive you, driveway and hits you. That is in contrast when I just observe you here in the room and I want to figure out whether you are actually still interested in this talk or whether I should rather really wrap up. I want to probably observe you here for a few minutes just in just a few seconds. So in the idea, you know, that we adapt our evidence integration kernel to different environments is not a new one and there are actually already quite a few papers who talk about leaky evidence integration and how we can adapt our in evidence integration kernels to different environmental statistics. So my work builds on these studies. First of all, I wanted to design a study or a task which allows me to get a direct empirical readout of these evidence integration kernels. And second, I wanted to look for neural correlates using EEG. So how did I do that? Um, I worked with the random dot motion paradigm that I showed you just a few seconds ago, but I turned it into a continuous task. What that means is I trained participants to watch blocks of five minutes of randomly moving dots. And um, what happens here is usually you're in a baseline period where the overall net motion is zero. But then there will be periods, we call them response periods, in which there will be a deviation and the net motion will deviate to the left or to the right. So to make this a bit easier for you here, the fixation dot will turn gray every time a response period starts and turn blue when it goes back to baseline. But obviously my participants did not get that cue when um, actually the deviation would happen. And so what we then do is we um, reward participants if they correctly detect these response periods or we punish them if they miss the response period or false alarm, meaning they respond during the baseline period. So um, what is really crucial for this task is actually participants don't see this black line in this upper graph, but actually this wiggly line, the noise, so this is controlled by me, meaning I know exactly what happens every millisecond, and it's Gaussian distributed around the signal. That means every few hundred milliseconds or so, the coherence, which is the fraction of dots moving in a certain direction, will jump around. And that feature is actually crucial when we want to look at evidence integration kernels in the behavior. Because what we can do now is actually, we can cut out the stimulus leading up to a response and average this across all responses. And what we get is this really nice evidence integration kernel what um, tells us how far back in time participants in integrate evidence and how they weigh it. What is really nice about this, we can also quantify this by fitting an exponential function to this um, graph. So here we have a time constant tau, which again tells you how far back in time the participant is integrating and an amplitude, which is A. So um, what we are really interested to see was also like, do, can we push around these evidence integration kernels? And in order to do that, I chose a two by two design in which I changed the environmental statistics. So what I did do is um, I changed the length of the response period, which could either be short or long, which is represented in the rows, or these response periods could change in frequency. They could either be frequent or rare. So, and then I hypothesized that this would indeed, you know, change the time constant tau or the threshold of evidence you need to con commit to a decision. So, um, first I would like to show you some simple evidence that indeed my participants did adapt to these different conditions. So what you see here is the detection rate. That is the fraction of response periods um, participants correctly identified. And here I only show the results for the long um, re um, response periods. So what you can see is first of all, the higher the average coherence in these response periods were, the higher the detection rate. So that is, I guess, quite expected. But we, what we also see is that the detection rate is overall higher for frequent response periods than for rare one, because you're a lot more cautious in the rare conditions to commit to a response. And then we can also look at the short response periods, which are a bit harder to detect overall. And again, we also find the, the difference between frequent and rare response conditions. 
So now what we really care about are these evidence integration kernels. So let's see what happens with them in the different conditions. So what I'm showing you here again are the evidence integration kernels for long response periods. And as you can see here, if you look at the blue line, which is for where conditions, you need more evidence for them and you integrate slightly further back in time than you do for um, the frequent ones, which is the orange line. So now we can go ahead and we can quantify that um, by um, fitting our um, exponential function to these evidence integration kernels. And here are the results by looking at the estimated tau's for each participant. You can see here again that um, the t time constant for the rare conditions is higher than for the frequent one. Interesting though is um, that we didn't find a difference between short versus long response periods. That was quite surprising because I really thought that this would push around the time constant of the participants. What I suspect is that, you know, that the manipulation we chose for three seconds versus, versus five seconds response periods wasn't big enough to really push this evidence kernel around, even though other behavioral results suggest that participants adapted to these periods as well. Yeah, um, and so therefore it's not surprising that we did not find, you know, a significant difference in the tau for short versus um, long response periods, but there was also no difference in the amplitude for, uh, for either um, manipulation. So um, now a small side note, because that was really an unexpected result. Um, you know, we were really interested in these different conditions and uh, the difference between them. But it turns out that the variability between the conditions wasn't the biggest one. It was actually higher between subjects. What I mean by that is if you look at the cost correlation graphs, you can see that along the diagonal, there's quite a spread, which means that you know, there were subjects that in all, robustly in all four conditions integrated further back in time, such as subject one, but there were also other subjects that you know, had very short time constants like subject three, which only really cared about the imminent past about the last couple of seconds. So I think that is quite cool and it's actually, I guess, really um, worth looking into it further. So now I really would also like to talk to you about the EEG results. And um, this is inspired by previous work from the O'Connell and Chris Summerfield labs who already looked at you know, single trial-based evidence integration paradigms in humans. And what they find is a positive central parietal uh, signal that also shows this typical um, evidence accumulation to threshold signal that we also know from single unit recordings in monkeys. So how did I get, uh, go about you know, with this noisy stimulus and to get actually at the neural correlates? So what I did is I related the entire noisy stimulus stream to the con continuous EEG signal. Now the issue here is um, that the events on the, sig on the EEG signal for these events will um, overlap. So what I need to do is um, a convolutional GLM approach that allows me to unmix these signals. And this has actually been um, a method that recently is more often used in EEG analysis. So what that means is I take the events of my noisy stimulus stream and I build up this um, design matrix and here each column captures the impulse response to these events at different latency relative to the stimulus onset. And then I can use this to estimate my betas basically you know, for each column, so for each time point, so I get the response um, over time. So, and indeed, for I have several regressors for which I find quite reliable responses across subjects. So one of these regressors is just that there is a jump, that there is a change in coherence. But we could also use a parametric regressor which tracks the magnitude of change when a jump in coherence occurs. And what you can see here, we get a really nice evoked response, but we can also see that we find this nice parietal positivity signal that O'Connell also detected previously. So again, we are obviously interested what happens in these different conditions. So on the left is just again the evoked response for that each stimulus occur that an event occurs. And on the left side, you can see when we look at the parametric change, so meaning the magnitude of change in the evidence when a jump occurs. And again, you can see that the evoked response for rare um, response conditions is higher than for the frequent ones. 
However, as for the behavioral integration kernels, there wasn't a difference between short versus long response periods. So this result perhaps makes sense in that large changes in evidence are actually less common in the rare condition than the frequent. And so this might be like a change detection signal that can actually be adapted between these different environmental um, conditions. So, and I have one final result because, you know, um, or what I was also wondering was like, do I actually measure a decision-making signal or is this just, you know, lower level sensory processing? I was a bit worried about that. So what I did is I did a small control study in which I introduced vertical motion as decision irrelevant motion. So the whole time participants should only focus on the horizontal motion left versus right. But the environmental statistics of the vertical motion were exactly the same as for the decision relevant one. And what you can see here on the right is that, you know, that the response to this decision irrelevant motion is very much blunted in comparison to the horizontal the decision relevant one. So this makes me quite confident that actually what I'm seeing here is a decision signal and not low level sensory surprise. So now one final result. Um, you know, you remember I showed you that we have these very robust evidence integration kernels for each subject, and I was really interested whether we could actually find um, a neural correlate for this in the brain. So I correlated the time constant that I fitted for each subject with um, a regressor that tracks the absolute stimulus. And what I do find here is actually, yes, indeed, we do find a correlation um, between parts of this um, evoke response for this regressor and the TAUS. And I think that is actually really nice. So um, in conclusion, I developed a novel sensory decision-making task that allows us to measure weighting of past evidence in continuous environments and changing the statistics of these environments influences both the behavioral integration kernels but also the neural responses. The measured EEG response is um, related to evidence integration and not due to a lower level sensory uh, process. And the behavioral integration kernels can be robustly measured, appear variable across subjects, and correlate with the relevant EEG integration signals. Thank you so much for listening. Um, yeah, this work would definitely not be possible without these amazing people. Uh, foremost, obviously, Lawrence Hunt, my PhD supervisor, who helped me not only to survive my PhD, but also very much enjoy it. Thank you. Great, thanks so much, Maria. And we've got time for a couple questions, I think. Well, I have a question to kick us off. So I was really interested in this kind of between subject variability that you saw. Yeah. So can you say more about the relationship between the neural correlates of that and the behavioral correlates across subjects? And if that relates at all to overall performance on the task? Well, I actually haven't looked at that yet. Um, so I couldn't really say whether there's a relationship to um, the performance. This is actually quite a new result that I, you know, I really just went ahead and took the different requests I used and see and, and tried to figure out whether I could actually find any um, you know, correlation at all. So the, also the thing is that, you know, that the signal that we um, find here for the absolute stimulus, we're not entirely sure yet what it means. So other labs like the Chris Summerfield lab also finds the signal and we are yet trying to figure out what it actually means for the decision process, or that might be like here something like predictive coding, you know, because you can see if you look at the topography, that signal seems to vary between more lower, um, lower level sensory, sensory areas and the parietal cortex. Hmm. Oh, really interesting, thanks. We have one more question over here. Yeah, a uh, very cool paradigm. I had a question about the decision irrelevant kernels, uh, because although they were a lot lower amplitude, it looked like there's a similar time course to them. And I was wondering if your interpretation about tau as reflecting a decision process um, makes sense in light of that. Well, um, we didn't correlate tau exactly with that regressor, right? So tau was more correlated with the entire stimulus stream that we used an, as a regressor. So I don't see why um, that should be a problem here. Because even though, yes, participants might have, you know, slightly tracked this um, vertical motion, I think it's still very obvious that, you know, most of the attention or that, you know, the brain focuses really on the, on the horizontal and the decision relevant um, information. Right, but would, would we not think that, so is the, um, the only change between these two appears to be an amplitude one, not a timescale one, right? 
at least from by eye. I was wondering if you'd done anything quantitative. Yes. Um, no, I haven't done anything computational one. And yes, that is true that you can maybe, as, at least for the second one, you can s still see that there is, you know, a small, you know, right bump in the signal. That is true. Um, but I haven't really looked at that, what that could potentially mean for, for tau and the evidence integration. Because also what is true is this is only tracking the jump, right? This is only in the noise when there is um, a jump in the coherence level. So it's more like a change detection signal. I don't think this, you know, represents the evidence ram to decision process. Thank you. All right, great. Let's thank Maria one more time and we can have Philip come up. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Philip Witkowski. I'm a graduate student at the University of California Davis Center for Mind and Brain. Today, I'm going to be talking to you guys about work that I've been doing to illuminate the neural mechanisms of credit assignment, specifically looking at the ways in which we can uh, infer um, choice outcome relationships from knowing the relational structure of our environment. And I'm really excited to present this because I think this research sort of like touches on this really important point of how we learn about causal relationships in complex and structured environments. And so I want to start with an example of what I mean by the relational structure of our environment and what it means to observe, or sorry, infer something that we have not observed. So let's imagine that you like to gather food in the area around where you live. It doesn't matter where, but let's say that this area has one strawberry bush, one peach tree, and one orange tree. Now, over the summer, you sampled from the strawberry bush many, many times, and you know that if you go there and you choose to like, search for food here, you're likely to end up with the outcome that you want, a really tasty snack. Um, in contrast, because the peach tree and the orange trees are not bearing fruit, going there is going to be a waste of time. You're not going to find anything, right? But after a while, those strawberries are going to go bad, as they do throughout the year. And when they do, you're going to have to find out where the new high-quality food is. Where are you going to search to get the outcome that you want, which is more food? Doing this requires knowing that there's an underlying latent structure to the way that food grows. And this is called seasonality. So seasonality doesn't just govern the way strawberries grow, but it governs the way all food grows. And if you know that peaches are ripe in the spring, go bad in the fall, right when, or sorry, strawberries are ripe in the spring, go bad in the uh, late summer, early fall, right when peaches are starting to become ripe. And then those go bad in the winter, right when oranges are starting to be ripe too, which continue on being ripe through the spring and then go bad again in the, um, in the spring. You can know something about the quality of peaches and oranges from observing the quality of strawberries. Specifically by understanding the cycle, you can infer that the new best food to go to is peaches, um, which is going to lead you to your desired outcome of more food. Whereas searching for oranges is likely to be a fruitless endeavor. So this can be hugely beneficial when you have limited resources and time, like most, um, like most foraging animals. But examples like this abound in the real world as well, where something like you know, an increase in meta stock might in, or predict an increase in Microsoft stock because of an underlying latent cause known as a tech bubble. So abstract, abstract representations such as this um, are, thought to re, are thought to be encoded by the ventromedial prefrontal cortex and entorhinal cortex. So one example of this is an amazing study by Alexandra um, Constantinescu and colleagues, which showed that when participants had to manipulate the neck and leg lengths of birds to achieve rewards, these regions coded a condensed representation of the underlying 2D task structure, which supported navigation through this abstract space as they were going to um, get rewards. At the same time, really compelling work from um, Eric Knudsen and Joni Wallace has shown that neurons in the hippocampus track positions within these latent task structures or spaces. Um, so in this task, monkeys had to choose between two of three different pictures, um, which led to juice rewards with different probabilities. So they found that neurons in the hippocampus um, tracked 
um, positions within this 3D association space, thereby helping the learner track their current state in the task and infer which option would be the next, or the, which option would be best to choose next. So these studies show that um, these, this relational knowledge is critical to learning and decision making, and we just wanna take this one step further and ask, what is the role of these representations in doing credit assignment when we can infer certain relationships that we haven't necessarily observed? Oh, sorry. Okay, so to understand the neural mechanisms of credit assignment for inferred relationships, we designed a hierarchical reversal learning task structure in which subjects learn the interrelationships between two systems of shapes. System one was made up of shapes A and B, which were inversely related to each other, such that whatever outcome A led to, B would always lead to the opposite. System two was similarly made up of shapes C and D, um, which also shared that inverse relationship. And then each system was defined by a particular probability. Um, so shape, or system one was defined by the probability Q1, and system two was defined by the probability Q2. So on each trial of the task, subjects got two of these four shapes to choose from, and they were instructed to make their shapes based on two quantities. One was the probability that a given choice would lead to a certain outcome, and the other is the value of that outcome. So you can see at the top there's two uh, point values in two different colors. Those point values told um, the subjects how valuable each outcome was, and the color told you which outcome that um, value belonged to. So here it would be like 30 points on a Starbucks gift card and 70 points on an iTunes gift card. Now, these points were randomly generated on every trial, and subjects needed to maximize how many points they got on each trial because at the end we were going to randomly choose one of those trials for random or for uh, actual value. And so they were incentivized to try and get the highest value on each trial and really had to think about what outcome that um, choice would lead, would lead them to. We then changed the probabilities that each of these systems um, were defined by uh, throughout the experiment. So they went through a total of three reversals over the course of the experiment such that if they first learned that like shape A would lead to outcome one and B led to outcome two, that would reverse at some point and then reverse two more times after that. So the first thing we wanted to test was whether um, participants were actively integrating both experienced and inferred information. And we did that by looking at the influence of previous choice outcome um, associations on the current choice. And so this would look something like this, where if they chose shape A and it led to iTunes, and then there's another trial where they wanted to get iTunes again, that should drive up the likelihood that they're gonna choose A on this trial. Um, and indeed, as you go further back in time, so if this happened two or three trials ago, that should have less of an influence on the current choice. And this is exactly what we see. So we see that one trial ago, we have a pretty strong influence on the current choice, and as you go back in time, that influence starts to wane. The next thing we wanna ask is what happens for inferred information. So this would be something like if you chose shape B on a previous trial and it led to Starbucks, but now you want iTunes and A is available, that should tell you that A is very likely to lead to that iTunes gift card. Um, and again, this should have a really strong influence or relatively strong influence if you're starting like one trial ago and then go back as you go back in time. Um, and indeed, that is what we see. The um, inferred trials also have this same function of being strong if it happened very recently and then um, weakening as it goes back in time. So next we wanted to estimate trial by trial um, learning trajectories through the task. And to do this, we defined three Bayesian learning models, which reflect three possible ways that subjects could be engaging with the task. One is learning from experienced only outcome, or experienced outcomes only. And this would be like if subjects disregarded everything we said, didn't know the structure of the task, and just went on doing their thing. The other would be participants um, being perfect inferrers. So they learn with exacting precision that contingencies for B were always the precise opposite of those of A and they learn like an optimal Bayesian. Or maybe participants were somewhere in between these two extremes and learned through inference, but not quite perfectly. Um, we modeled this by adding a gamma term, which you can see here between A and B. So this term basically weighted the amount of information that they would learn through inference so that you know maybe they would get some information, but not all of it. Um, and we compared these by using them to one fit to participant choice, participant choice data, but also to predict, predict new choices using forward chaining cross validation. Um, and what we see in both cases is that this weighted inference model greatly outperforms both of the other models um, when predicting participants' data and also um, just fitting their data in general. 
Um, so next we wanted to take this model and then go into the brain and look at the neural processes involved with integrating inferred information into beliefs about these choice outcome contingencies. And to give you an intuition of what this looks like, um, this red line shows the belief trajectory for what one subject could have estimated the choice outcome contingency to be for shape A, given that it was able to integrate information. So each point on this line just describes a belief that they have about shape A leading to outcome one on each trial. We can do that as well for a model where they can't infer. And so now we have what they might believe the estimates to be if they weren't able to infer um, through these structural relations. And so note that these trajectories differ because the updates that you can make between each point change based on whether you can make that inference or not. And we can describe the amount, the additional amount of information gained or the change in that update using the um, DKL. So what I'm showing here at the bottom in the red line is the amount of information you've gained by moving from one belief to another in the top red line for that inferred model. The yellow line um, at the bottom is then the information gained between updates for the no inference model. And the purple area in between is the extra information that you get for being able to infer. And then we can go in and look at the time of feedback in the brain and see what areas correlate or what areas have activation that correlates with this additional information gained through inference. Um, and we see areas um, such as um, dorsal anterior um, cingulate and DLPFC and insula consistent with their role in updating beliefs about associations. But moreover, we also found an effect in VTA, um, suggesting that there was some dopaminergic activity that was involved in updating the stimulus outcome associations. This builds on the work of others showing that dopamine is involved in outcome um, identity error signaling, but extends that work to show that it also applies to signals um, about inferred identity errors as well. The next question we wanted to address was whether codes for the latent causal relationship were active during feedback, suggesting a role in the credit assignment process. So to do this, we trained a linear SVM classifier to differentiate between the two systems. So here what we did was we trained a classifier to differentiate between, for example, shapes A and shape C, both when they led to the Starbucks gift card. Then we tested that classifier on trials where the subjects chose either shape B or shape D, and both of those led to the iTunes gift card. So by linking those two things together, we've controlled for both the outcome identity and the choice identity. All the classifier can pick up is whether they belong to the same system of inverse relationships or not. Um, and then we iterated through all the different possible combinations and averaged over them. And what we find is that these representations exist pretty precisely in medial prefrontal cortex during that um, feedback time. But we want to take this a little step further and show that these are related to the updating process in general, really linking these representations to credit assignment. And one prediction you might make is that the strength of these representations might be greater when you have to use those structural relations to make really big updates. And so what we did was we took the distance from the hyperplane for that SVM as a measure of how strong that representation was or how well the SVM could categorize it and correlated it with the DKL term or these Bayesian updates, the information gained by moving from one probability distribution to the other. And what we find is a very similar region of medial prefrontal cortex um, is correlated with this DKL term. Again, linking this to the choice, or updates to the choice outcome associations that, associations that were made and credit assignment. The final question we wanted to ask in this project were what regions were tracking the latent association space of the task. And this is essentially like asking which regions are encoding our current estimate of what season we're in as we're moving through the task. So to do this, we used representational similarity analysis and we began by constructing an RDM that measured the statistical difference between belief distributions um, across tri or in trials across blocks, but in the same system independently. And here we just used the Jensen-Shannon distance. But what this looks like is that when you have two trials where subjects held similar beliefs about the uh, choice outcome contingencies, the um, distributions are very similar. And so the neural representation might be really similar if this region is coding the space. And in contrast, trials where they held very different beliefs should correlate with different neural representations or very different neural representations. So we correlated this distance metric with the Euclidean distance between neural representations um, and looked 
of using a whole brain searchlight during the ITI, which is when Eric Newson and Junie Wallace found um, their effects. Uh, we also controlled for various confounds here, such as outcome identity, choice identity, re and reward prediction error, as well as a few others. Um, and what we see are um, LOFC, so lateral orbital frontal cortex, and a more rostral area of the medial prefrontal cortex, coded these, um, they did space-like tracking of these codes of where you are in the association space. And so these findings really support the theory that the OFC represents an animal's current position within the task space, um, even if it can't be directly observed, and connects with other findings showing that the OFC plays a critical role in representing task-specific uh, relational knowledge for model-based inference. Um, so in conclusion, um, the MPFC supports model-based credit assignment for inferred but unobserved relationships via structural knowledge of the task. We've also shown you that DLPFC and Insula, as well as VTA, um, are involved in updating these stimulus outcome contingencies, suggesting a role for dopamine in um, updating both from both inferred and experienced information. And then last, as I just showed you, uh, medial prefrontal cortex and LOFC contain codes for positions within the latent association space um, as learning evolved. Um, so thank you guys for coming to the talk. Please come to my poster tomorrow night if you wanna talk about more details. Um, there's a link to the Neuron article uh, here in this QR code, and I'll just end by saying thank you to the lab, especially Erie and Alex, who helped me through this project. Hey, thanks, Philip, for that really great talk. I think we might have time for a couple quick questions here. Uh, so I have one question. So one thing I was wondering about at the end, you showed that there's these two regions, OFC and PFC, that both represent the structure of the task. Yeah. Do you think there's any difference in the representational format within the, between those two areas or their, their role in the task? Like what they're actually coding? Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know if I could speak to that right now. Um, we are testing the idea that maybe there's different levels of the hierarchy that these two regions might be representing. So um, with LOFC, it might be like a more concrete code for just like the specific choice outcome relationships within a system. Whereas you might imagine that someplace like the VMPFC, which has been shown to kind of like generalize over different sorts of tasks, might show like a more generalized sort of probability space or maybe even like not really probability space, but just anything that can be coded in space in general, right? And so it'll be kind of like coding both of those systems as like a shared representation. Um, I don't have any data to speak to that yet, but if I had to like pontificate and sort of guess, that might be one thing that it might do. Well, thanks. Mm -hmm. All right, and I think um, that'll be it for this session, but we can give one more round of applause to all of our speakers. <laughs> and thanks again to all four of you for the really engaging talks. Great, that's it for uh, today's oral talk and interactive sessions here, but we've got posters after dinner, so uh, go find those drink tickets in your name tag and come back after dinner for more posters and more beverages. See you then.